Dear Mr. President, dear Professor Snyder, Dr. Grabby, dear guests, welcome to the second day of our conference dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the Mauerfall and to the 23rd Open Society Forum. It would be a real challenge to find a more significant day for civil society to celebrate freedom and active citizenship. And it would be also a challenge to find more iconic venue to discuss today. This place, the Estonian Riders House, carries an outstanding legacy of standing up for liberty, freedom of speech, and a simple human touch, even in the darkest times in our history. Intellectual community was one of the driving forces behind our democratic movement 30 years ago. Today, we observe perhaps one of the democracy's most demanding points. The question is whether there are chances to create a new, credible, and positive narrative on liberal democracy and its values. Before I give the floor to our guests and speakers, I would like to thank our speakers for coming here today, and I would like to thank you, the great audience, for coming here to this forum at this very remarkable day day of hope and day of conviction that we can move the walls. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here in Tallinn again. Um, and the Open Estonia Forum has become, um, over the years, um, an annual highlight of uh, debate, not only about the current uh, politics and situation we find ourselves in here in Europe and in our societies, but also about the past and the future. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's a very symbolic day today. Many of us could be elsewhere, for example, in Berlin or other, uh, other places where there were enormous uh, events 30 years ago. Um, and it's especially um, uh, important that um, here in Estonia, um, we think about uh, the past 30 years and what's happened in this country in the light of the movements across the whole continent. So we have an opportunity this afternoon to speak with somebody very familiar to, your, to, to you all as the president of Estonia and somebody who lived through a remarkable history both in this country but also in, <coughs> in Europe as a whole and of course a historian who has um, considered um, the, um, the, the progress and the development of both liberal democracy as Mal was speaking of and also of, <coughs> sorry, um, and, and also of uh, what it means to be human in very interesting ways. So we have a chance to have a really quite wide-ranging conversation across um, a number of contemporary issues and, and dilemmas for our societies, um, and then also to involve the audiences. So we'll start with um, uh, a conversation here on the podium, and then I will, I'll come to um, your contributions and, and questions in particular um, after that. So I really wanted to start with um, the question that, that Mal Halam and the Open Estonia um, Foundation posed at the very beginning of this, which is um, we've seen a resurgence of what can be called nationalism, and of course there are plenty of ways of defining it and discussing it um, here in Europe. Um, and she's asked the question of, is, it, is there a bright side of nationalism? Um, is nationalism always at odds with liberal democracy? Now, that's the kind of essay question that you might get as a student. Um, uh, but it's also something very fundamental, um, because often the term nationalism is used as a term of abuse rather than a term of, of analysis. So I'd like to start um, by inviting um, uh, Thomas Ilves, um, uh, to uh, to give us his view on this question. 
You've seen many different kinds of nationalism um, in this country and elsewhere over, over the past. Is there a bright side to it, and is it still a useful category of reference? Well, first of all, I would say that um, there was a fairly primitive understanding of the concept of nationalism in the, uh, in the West, uh, rather, uh, uh, when Europe became free again. And I remember lectures that Estonians would give, oh, you people shouldn't be nationalists. And, and here I would say that, that really there was a, quite a difference between what was said and what was feared and what we had in this country. I mean, I would say we have had uh, for a long time a very positive nationalism, very different from what some other forms in that I think Estonians are simply glad that their culture has survived and have, it's not, it is not to be better than anyone else. There is none of this like we're superior, which is a common, which is an attribute in many forms of, I mean, you would say the best known obviously is uh, Germany in the uh, 1930s and 40s, uh, and which we even see today in some of the, some of the rhetoric coming out of Russia. Uh, here, I mean, basically, you know, we sang, right? And we're like so happy we can sing and be, uh, sing our songs. Uh, it's never that, oh, we're superior to the Finns or the Latvians, let alone the Russians, but it's like, wow, we've managed to keep this going. And it makes, I mean, it's really a happy event when we have our song festival every year. Uh, but then there are other forms uh, which uh, here has been sort of rearing its head in the past couple of years, which is that, well, we're better than people who have a different skin color, or we're better than people who have a different religion, and and that is uh, that is the kind of nationalism that that um, I guess we were warned against in the early 90s, and as we were discussing earlier, we had, uh, you know, had uh, Robert Kaplan had this expression. Uh, ancient tribal hatreds, which was uh, used uh, to describe the conflict in the Balkans, especially well, during the Balkan Wars. And this was kind of spread to the rest of the rest of Eastern Europe in, I would say, a fairly sort of um, <clears throat> nasty way in positions held by some West European countries. And I remember being lectured about this, you know. And of course, that, lec that lecture has kind of disappeared especially when American diplomats used to say in the early 90s, you know, you people have to watch out for ancient tribal hatreds. And then I go, well, uh, I mean, nowadays especially, I don't see anyone sort of promoting anything in this country that would be remotely related to uh, sort of, you know, we have to keep our Confederate uh, statues up or anything like that. So I think there are differences, and I would also say that uh, no one is immune. I think that's one of the other lessons. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, yeah, I think that when we look at the general trend in this country, and I would also say at this point that, in fact, the, uh, the history of Estonian sort of nationalism, in quotes, actually beginning in the 18, uh, I mean, sort of 19th century, sort of maybe around uh, the 1840s, was that we want to be equal because we were not equal, we were the Undeutsch, and we can look at the Estonian flag was, uh, the blue, black, and white was actually a, a concept copied from the liberal students of the 1848 revolutions in Europe, and it was a symbol of liberté, égalité, and fraternité, uh, and bizarrely enough today, it's kind of used some, by some as a nationalist symbol of we're better than other people, when in fact the whole history of Estonia has really been to try to, re to be taken as equals with whoever the overlords were, be they uh, in the 19th century, the German aristocracy, or during the Soviet period, the, uh, the uh, occupation forces that were running this country. Thank you. Now, um, Tim, you've looked at this question in some detail, and my impression is that you're not so very keen on the nation state. That might be a, um, an understatement, in the sense that you've seen other ways of dealing with the question of identity as more helpful, but also um, particularly the European Union as an answer to the many dilemmas of nation states, how they organize themselves, how they protect themselves, and how they relate to one another. 
Um, is nationalism something that's incompatible with the European Union? I think the, the best way to think about the nation, and I'm going to say nation rather than nationalism and nation rather than the, the nation state, because I don't think anyone's too sure what a nation state actually is. I'm going to say nation because it, it gives us some flexibility. So I, I think that the crucial question with the identification with the nation is whether it helps you on to doing other things or whether it hinders you from doing other things. So if Franklin Delano Roosevelt says it's the job of Americans as a nation to build dams and, and public works, or if, if Dwight Eisenhower says it's the job of the American nation to build a highway system, and we do, that's one thing. If another president says it's our job to build a wall and we don't because we don't build things anymore, we just talk about them. That's something else entirely. So I think the, 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 the basic question is whether the nation is helping you towards something. And that could be something as simple as my example, whether you're building things or not. But it could also be, as you suggest, um, an institutional question. So the, the European Union. You can't join the European Union personally I mean, if you could, I know a number of people who would, right? Um, but you can't join it as a person. You can only join it as a state. And it's perfectly reasonable to say, and people did say back in the 90s, I want to help my state uh, be a better state. I want, I want my nation to help my state be a better state so we can join the European Union. Why is that perfectly reasonable? Not just for the obvious reasons of, of free travel and prosperity and so on, but also because the, the, the state needs something bigger. You're going to have a hard time finding prosper in the history of the modern world. You're going to have a hard time finding states that were prosperous and democratic that were not part of something bigger. Um, and you know, the history of Europe is not full of examples of isolated, prosperous, liberal nation states. You're not going to find them. The big success of democracy in Europe is a collective success after the Second World War, largely thanks to the European Union. The history of Europe is not the history of nation states never happened, never will happen. Uh, the history of Europe is history of empires, for the most part, right? I mean, I'm happy to give you, you know, Andorra and Liechtenstein, and um, I'm not happy to give the Swedes Sweden as much as they insist. Uh, it, it's the history of empires, and the European Union is the answer to the question: What do you do after empire? And it's a good question, right? If, whether you're facing it as Estonia after the Soviet Union or whether you're facing it in Britain in the 1960s as you lose your own maritime empire. It's a good question, what do you do after empire? It's the main European question of the 20th century, and there's an answer. Of course, if you forget the whole history of the 20th century, you forget that's the question. But there was a time when everyone knew that was the question, whether it was the early 90s in the Baltics, or if you read the parliamentary debates in Great Britain in the 1960s, there was a time when everyone in Britain knew that that was the question, what to do after empire. The question of whether you want to be a nation state or not is a meaningless question. Yeah, you can be a nation state, you'll fail, right? You'll fail. Um, England will fail. Estonia without the European Union will fail. So, but I mean, I mean this as part of a larger point, which is if becoming Estonia is a way to become something greater, morally or politically, then the nation's positive. But it can also work a different way, as, as Thomas Elvis has suggested. The, the nation can also be a way of, of saying, of, of not doing anything, but just discursively saying who's in and who's out, which is, by the way, a way of doing nothing, right? I mean, the reason I, I use the, the wall example, so I'll use it again. The, the, there are two reasons why America will never build the wall. The first is we don't build things anymore. But the second is that if Mr. Trump ever actually built the wall, then he couldn't say the evil Democrats are stopping me from building the wall, right? So we'll never actually build the wall, right? Um, so the, the, the wall is a discursive figure. The wall allows us to say we're us and they're them, we're innocent and they're, and they're guilty, right? Now that, that kind of nationalism doesn't lead anywhere. It doesn't lead you to create anything. It doesn't lead you to join larger institutions. It just turns politics into this question of, of, of us and them. And by the way, I'm not actually sure that this whole us and them business really is nationalism. And I want to I want to just I'll leave you with this thought, because if you're if it's going to be nationalism, it has to be particular to your nation. And the striking thing about what we're calling nationalism in Europe and the US 
is that it has nothing to do with the specific situation of your own country, right? I mean, if white supremacists in America and Estonian nationalists are both talking about the gays, the Muslims, the Jews, and the gay Muslim Jews, um, that is not nationalism. That's plagiarism. Or it's internationalism, because everyone is saying the same thing. Or it actually doesn't have much to do with human beings at all because what's happening is that real human politicians are just saying with their human mouths the things that have tested best with algorithms on what people are afraid of. And if that's true, it can't be nationalism because nationalism has to be about people and the algorithms are not about people, right? So if your government is saying we should all be afraid of the Muslims and the Jews and the gay Muslim Jews and the refugees that they bring, um, and all the children they have, right? Those gay Muslim Jews have a lot of children, as we know. If your, if your government is saying the same thing that all everybody else's government is saying, and it's the same thing which the computers are telling them to say, I'm not sure that it's even nationalism. Well, in fact, there's a, I mean, there is this uh, extreme poverty of originality, so that we see uh, here in this country, uh, we have taken, uh, some people have taken over uh, wholesale the rhetoric of the United States regarding the deep state, which, in fact, there, I don't know if there is a state that is as thin <laughs> as, as Estonia. And, uh, it, it's, uh, but it's, it's used as this meme, as is, I mean, other ones, you know, you, they've taken over uh, this term of cultural Bolshevism, which is something used by the Nazis. I don't know how many people know that, but if you hear, some of these political people talking about cultural Bolshevism, that is strictly a 1920s, 1930s NSDAP meme. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when someone writes about the endgültige Lösung, you're getting really deep into the Nazi rhetoric as the endgültige Lösung is the final solution, which we know was adopted by the Nazis as their policy to eliminate all Jews. Now, when you see people using language like that, um, or the meme, the, the other international meme, which is going like this, mm -hmm. uh, which then can be, which was very cleverly always dismissed as, oh, we'll show you a picture of you know, Barack Obama doing this. But it is a white supremacist meme, which I guess you told me originally came from the KKK, right? I mean, uh, you know, that is, there's a bizarre nationalism of we will copy each other's memes. We use the same language, we use the same memes, mm -hmm. same terms, uh, and none of it is very original, which on the one hand speaks to the lack of uh, intellectual capacity on the part of the people using it, and secondly, it really is bizarre that you have this international, the, the common term of nationalism. And yet, it's also something that has worked. It's a trick that's worked before. It's a trick that works in many different countries, and that's why they copy one another. And they can copy one another faster because of the digital world. Um, so it, things can, can go through um, social media incredibly quickly, and they get translated into different languages. But it's also something that seems to be kind of intergenerational, um, that uh, these memes come back every two generations. We, you see where they lead. Terrible things happen. Uh, people say these terrible things must never happen again, and therefore we don't have these memes, and then somehow we forget. Now, is this forgetting um, partly because of the way that the world is now changing so fast and the digitalization of politics and um, of democracy, which means that uh, people are, are given so much information, they're given so many different things to conjure with, that it actually becomes quite hard to discern what should be the topic of democratic debate, what should be the, the grounds of political contestation. And that's why it's easy to come up with these very basic memes that appeal to the basest instincts of people, rather than talking about, for example, policies, policies to, to try to tackle climate change, policies to, to regulate and, and indeed to, to build things. I'm curious as to, to what you think about how much of this is the same old stuff that's familiar from the 1930s, but also from the 1880s and before for, um, and how much of this is um, simplistic messages, but which are all the more powerful um, and can reach much further because of digital means? I think it's also that things have become more complex. Mm. Uh, that is that today, uh, 
policies are really have become things that are really complex things to work out. And if you can simplify it to some kind of basic mm -hmm. uh, sort of uh, limbic system brain, mm -hmm. you know, sort of fast thinking, uh, yeah. a la, you know, Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman, that instead of re reasoning something through, mm -hmm. which takes time, effort, and actually some form of education, mm -hmm. but rather you just appeal to the raw emotions. Uh, that, I mean, that is a way to power, and we've seen this in many elections. Uh, I mean, most, I mean, I guess best known would be the elections in the United States, but certainly the fail, the failure of uh, Marine Le Pen uh, in uh, 2017, I mean, they were striving at the same thing, it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And if you look across these, uh, sort of what, what is common? I mean, this, this, this demonization of the elite, for example, the elite, which I find in Eastern Europe is utterly ridiculous because there is isn't, there is no aristocracy and we got, there are two kinds of elites that we've seen in Europe uh, before, the aristocratic, hereditary, and then there was the collaborative of the, uh, you know, you join the party and then you get a position. But we're, we're I mean, now we're dealing with meritocracy in a place like here, I mean, there is no long-term elite. Every, everyone started from scratch, right? So it's, mm -hmm. but yet it's, it's something picked up in all of them. We're ant against the elite, mm -hmm. forgetting that in fact, there is some minimal requirement of IQ and knowledge actually required to do policies, which is far more complex than belching slogans. So, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, I, let me pick it up at a different place. Mm. I want to pick it up. I want to pick it up with history because I want to. I, would, I want to repeat your premise that it's very hard to have democratic systems without history, and we've we've done it. We've done away with history in a couple of ways. There's there's the Western version, which is to say, you know, history was over because we won the Cold War. I mean, I'm looking at people who were born after that moment, but. And so, like, if there's no history, you know, you don't exist, and you don't exist, and you don't exist, right? But the idea that the liberal fallacy after the 19, after 1989 was to say, history is over, we now know how it all works, there's just going to be capitalism which leads to democracy. And if you say history is over, that also means the past doesn't matter. The past is just all details, which we now can sum up into this grand pattern, which means that we can then educate the next, next couple of generations to say that history doesn't matter. But then there's, there's the East European, let's call it conservative fallacy, which is only my story matters, right? And if only your story matters, then nothing matters, right? So if, if only Estonia matters, there's no Estonia. Because if only Estonia matters, we can't tell the history of Estonia because history of Estonia only makes sense with the Teutonic Knights and the Swedes and the Russians and the Soviet Union and so on, right? So, and that's true of everybody. I mean, the, the existence of the United States of America is a historical accident having to do with contestation between the French, British, and Spanish empires, right? So without that, you know, our story doesn't make any sense. So if you turn history into memory, sorry, I mean, I know you do memory in the right way, but if you turn, if you turn history entirely into memory, that is a story that's only about yourself, then you're also doing away with history. And so there's this weird kind of collaboration between the history is over and the history is all about me ideas, which has meant that nobody knows history anymore. And that makes it very hard to judge when your democracy is in trouble. Because then everyone says, oh, what's the red line? No, there's no, you know, and the historical answer is there isn't a red line. It's historically open. It depends on what people are going to do. And this, this brings me to facts. I mean, it's not just that the internet makes it hard. It's also that um, one thing that politicians do is they actively try to make the truth a discredited concept. Mr. Putin does this very effectively. Mr. Trump does this very, very effectively. Um, I mean, most of what the guy tweets is not, is not true. And a lot of, it's not just that it's not true, it's that it invokes conspiratorial thinking, which if you believe it, then starts to destroy other things, right? Because if you, the, a, cons, a conspiracy theory is like a wrecking ball that goes through reality and it, it clears away things. And so we now have this idea that like nothing is really true. And this is also, I mean, this is partly a left-wing problem where, you know, we said 
uh, on the left, well, it'll be very empowering for people if they get to make their own reality, which is not true. It's very empowering for the people who have television stations if we get to make our own reality, and it's very disempowering for everybody else, right? It's very empowering for billionaires if you get to make your own reality, but it's very disempowering for everybody else. You need the facts to defend yourself against this kind of thing. And where do the facts come from? The facts have to be created. The facts are costly. You have to pay people to go out and find the facts. And this is something which um, we have also lost track of. Again, Russia leads the way, um, but Americans then follow. Our local news is also dying. And then this is something that people inside the European Union have to watch out for, because if you guys lose local news too, then this whole factlessness will, 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 be, will be cut free. Then related to this is, um, is, is de-enlightenment. So, I mean, that's how I think of what's going on now is de-enlightenment, like the machines, the machines and their human collaborators are making us, um, you know, Professor Ilvis, uh, Prof Professor, I promoted you, President Ilvis um, used, used the phrase I IQ. I mean, how many of you know that IQ in the West is going down? It's been going down for 15 years, right? So if like, so if you're 18 years old, I mean, you're just doomed, right? I mean, so the, you're just going to keep getting dumber, you know, until and you, you, know, you, have a, you have a future and it's like negative. Um, of course, it's normalized so that in fact, we don't know, notice. Uh, it's right. going down, but then you're always, the median is always right. raised but to the, 100. But the darker way that it's normalized is that everybody who's using the internet is getting stupider at the same time so that you don't notice. Right, because everybody else is, no, you can't remember what happened yesterday, but the person next to you can't remember what happened yesterday either. So, you know, what's, 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 the, big, what's the big deal? Um, this not remembering what happened yesterday thing is something that university professors notice, right? Because we, you know, we keep having to give, we get the same lecture 30 times and nobody notices. Um, so, um, that was always the case, right. come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, it, I mean, what at least is basically, uh, in the West, we're going toward a brave new world, yeah. uh, and where, meanwhile, the the societies with uh, algori uh, the algorithmic authoritarianisms are moving right. towards 1984 and complete and utter surveillance. Yeah, yeah. So just if we could just finish the just yeah, finish the cool. thought, um, which is where like where this is all going because it's it is of course terrible that slogans from the 1920s and 30s are brought back, mm -hmm. but. It doesn't mean that the 1920s and 30s are brought back. There are some differences. So one of them I would point to is that in the 20s and 30s, people were using slogans to motivate. I mean, you actually were supposed to go out and march on the streets, for example. But you might have noticed that Mr. Putin and Mr. Trump, Mr. Z, they do not want you out on the streets marching. They want you at home right, staring at your screen. They will be happy to compromise if you just stay home and stare at your screen. So I think a big difference is that in the 20s and 30s, we were, we were, the, the idea of slogans, whether Stalinist or fascist, was to motivate you to do, you know, what we would now say is the wrong thing. Whereas I think now the slogans are part of a larger package, which is meant to get you angry and irritate you, but you're not actually supposed to do anything. You're supposed to just sit back and let, you know, watch wealth accumulate and watch the world end, you know, um, or ideally watch your screen while the world ends. And that's a, that's a different proposition. But this is, this is, I mean, one of the things, one reason I think old slogans are being used again is that, which can be used very effectively. Be, they were effective. They had an emotional response in 1925 and 1933. But if you have no knowledge of that, I mean, you have to, you actually have to know something about history to recognize that yeah. the use of endgültige Lösung by a party in 2019 actually refers to something that happened uh, like 80 years ago. But if most people don't know that, and if they don't know that cultural Bolshevism is a term used by the Nazis to denigrate the Democrats in Germany, then you go, oh, it is cultural Bolshevism. And you're right. not understanding what the context, what it, where it comes from, and that they are, they are real things used by bad people mm. you know, right. a long time ago. But there is a very big difference in terms of this motivation question. Um, it's true that you know, the internet is also an opiate of the people, of the masses, because the smartphone basically entertains us at all times, and therefore we stop doing things. I mean, look at how teenagers don't do sex and drugs and rock and roll anymore. They just sit in their beds feeling really, really depressed. Um, so uh, it's true, it has a demotivating effect. And that, of course, is partly why the dumbing down happens, because they're, they're lacking social interaction with one another. They're just interacting through the screen. But 
there is a key, key difference here, which is that um, people in the 1920s and 30s were encouraged to go out on the streets by the demagogues because ultimately they were mobilizing both for the eradication of certain groups in their society, and you could argue that's still happening. I mean, hate speech is having real-life consequences for minorities. Um, and it's not only the gay Muslim Jews, it's all kinds of other minorities as well. Sure. Um, but also, it was to mobilize them ultimately for war. It was ultimately to mobilize them for violence, for state-sponsored violence, to go out and fight other nations in order to create a new kind of empire, as, as you've argued, Tim. But these days, what do the demagogues really want? They clearly, some of them are happy to stay on the sidelines of power. They stay in the margins. They become populists who make a lot of noise, but they don't ultimately want power. I mean, I'd argue Nigel Farage. He doesn't really want to get into power and be responsible for anything. He's quite comfortable where he is. Salary. Whereas the others are in power. I mean, the Putins and the Erdogans and, and so on. And they, they want to hold on to power. And that's, they're mobilizing people to hold on to power. But ultimately, is it just about keeping their party there? Are they less dangerous than in the 20s and 30s because oh, no. they don't actually want to expand their territory? They do. They did. I mean, in order to raise his popularity. I mean, how did Putin's popularity, who right now is fairly low, was the same in 2013. And, and, then, he and then he went Crimea. into Crimea and, you know, and he sort of got, we got Crimea back and it went way up into the 90s. Now it's been sort of falling again. I mean, this is, this was also true in 2008 in Georgia, and uh, certainly uh, with Erdogan's popularity sort of suffering, then this recent sort of now we're finally going to get the PKK mm -hmm. is again, I mean, brought at least one hopes short-term benefits, uh, mm. not long-term. But, but is, is this just a hangover of small bits of incursion into territories? I mean, I, I don't want to diminish at all what happened in Crimea, but it is rather different from what happened at the beginning of the Second World War. I think, I mean, if we take the long historical view, mm. and this connects to what I said about what, what do you do after empire, mm. being the main question in the 20th century, the reason why what do you do after empire is the main question in the 20th century is that empire becomes unsustainable mm. for Europeans. And it becomes unsustainable because there is no longer any meaningful immunological or technological difference between Europeans and, and everyone else. And this holds, I mean, this, this holds for the Germans when they try to create an empire in Ukraine. Hitler's whole, whole rationale was, we will have distinct advantages over these people in the East, but that turns out not to be the case. And soon after, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, it turns out that the Soviets can't really win in Afghanistan, the Americans can't really win in Vietnam, and even now the Americans, you know, with our s astonishing military budget, we have a hard time conquering the way that people used to conquer. And so while I, I take the point completely about Russia invading Ukraine, and that has to be seen as a classical invasion involving military force and annexation and the kind of thing that wasn't supposed to happen anymore in Europe. It's killed about 13,000 people. There are about 2 million refugees, internal and, and external. It's a serious conflict, which is traumatic in all kinds of different ways. It's still not the same thing as the way the Red Army mobilized to take the Baltics in 1940. It's not the same thing as Operation Barbarossa in 1941. It is is much harder to take territory now. And I don't think that's the main way that we are being mobilized. I think the main way that we're being mobilized is to be so angry that we don't do anything, right? So in my country, um, we are now, you know, we are now at the state where if you are a citizen, you know you're not supposed to be afraid of ICE. If you don't know, ICE are the quasi the quasi-state actors who come in and t pull you out of your house if you're not properly documented and then deport you. It's not very pleasant. It just happened to a kid in the high school down the street from me. Um, it's traumatizing for him. It's also traumatizing for other kids in the school, right? And then what happens to him? He's, he is deported. Um, so, it, it, and this is happening, you know, we now have more people in our ICE detention centers than Germany had in concentration camps in 1938, which isn't to say that we're the same as Germany. It's just to draw your attention to the scale of the phenomenon. And what it means is that um, we as citizens are being asked to do nothing. That's all. Right? We're just being asked to let this happen. We, we, I don't have to break down any doors. Right? Okay, admittedly, we are being asked to denounce our neighbors. There is now an American Department of Denunciation. It has a different name, of course. Its name is Voice, which does sound a little bit like Department of Denunciation, if you think about it. But in general, we're just being asked to look, to look away. 
which is bad. And I, what I would argue is that this is all bad in a different way. Um, that is to say, the irresponsibility is itself bad, right? I mean, the 20th century was a century of horrible responsibility in a way, like Stalin and Hitler did take a kind of responsibility for what they were doing. Whereas this century is the kind of what, you know, who am I, right? Like even the white supremacist things, like they do it and then they say, oh, we're just kidding, right? Like Putin invades Ukraine, then he says, oh, well, who knows really, did I invade Ukraine or did those guys get their uniforms from a corner store? Right? That's what he said in April of 2014 to the press corps, right? And it's the same thing with Trump. You know, Trump says, hey, Russia, why don't you investigate? This is not now. Today it's, he's, it's, 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 today it's Russia, Ukraine, and China. Um, but in 2016, it was only Russia. He said, hey, Russia, why don't you investigate my political opponent, right? Which five hours later, Russia did. But then Trump said, oh, I was just kidding, right? But this whole just kidding thing, this total lack of responsibility is also devastating in its own way because it demobilizes and it also demoralizes. It's very hard for anyone to get hold of what's going on and, and, and to resist it. And then of course what's happening are the, are the bad things that are happening anyway, right? So a lot of the people who are, who are the bad actors now are like Mr. Putin are directly connected to a hydrocarbon industry which is going to destroy us as a species. And we're meant to look away from that happening. A lot of the people who helped get Mr. Trump elected in 2016 are directly, are directly connected to a digital industry which is causing us to stare at our phones as the world comes to an end. And by the way, every time you do a search on your phone, you're burning as much electricity as if you had put a, a kettle on the pot, a pot on the, on the stove to boil, right? Um, the, the, um, and not to make you feel guilty for tweeting, you should feel guilty about that anyway, but it's if, if um, because Professor Ilwis doesn't have his hashtag, that's why you should feel guilty. Um, the, but but the, 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 the internet uses, pollutes with carbon dioxide more than the airline industry. So maybe you feel bad about flying planes, but you know, you should probably feel worse about using the internet because you're probably polluting more using the internet. And somehow we don't even notice this. So a lot of it is getting us not to look at the accumulation of wealth and the accumulation of doom. Um, so it's like there's a kind of, there's a kind of like raging irresponsibility. So the raging irresponsibility, is that also because of citizens? That citizens' minds, brains are being changed by the use of the smartphones and the internet and so on. I mean, I, I raise this as a challenge to President Ilves, who's been the great proponent of Estonian e-governance. And I've experienced many, many times when he's come to other countries and lectured us on how we should all look like Estonia. Um, and there's no question that it's better to uh, do your taxes online than to waste the trees. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think we can feel guilty that a Google search costs as much uh, energy as leaving our light bulb on for an hour. But surely that's better than the old method of trying to go and find things, um, which, which was also could be rather consuming of, of energy um, and so on. But to the citizen's point is really, are citizens able to do their job in a democracy when they are confused, when they are used to conspiracy theory, which, um, as, as you just said, um, makes them less able to find what is the truth, less able to believe that there is a truth out there, uh, some kind of objective mm. truth to be found. Um, I mean, in all of the, the work that you've done on digital, Thomas, do you think that uh, people's brains are being fundamentally changed in ways that makes it harder for them to make democratic choices? Not yet, but I do think that we see there are certain ro routes that, that we see. I'd say that we have a trifurcation of futures. Um, what you see developing in the United States, and which you see also in Europe, but it's really run by, by Silicon Valley at this point, is, has been written up in a big fat book by, uh, called Surveillance Capitalism. And what we see is basically making your money by f collecting data on people. From Estonia's eastern border to the South China Sea, this huge landmass, we see an alternative form, which I would call algorithmic authoritarianism, which is basically uh, following, I mean, basically just also surveillance, but it's, it's to control society, whereas in the surveillance capitalism is to simply sell you stuff or make money from advertising. And that's why I say there's a difference between like sort of 1984 and, and Soma in, uh, in, um, in Brave New World. 
Now, where the question is, the, uh, the third road, which is only beginning to emerge and may die before it ever gets there, but is, is, a, is the, are sort of the cultural assumptions in Europe, which, which we see as first manifestation is GDPR, but a far greater concern with privacy and rights in this new world. Uh, than you see in the United States and which are completely ignored in the sort of algorithmic authoritarian world. Uh, and that's a hope, I, in fact. It's my hope that actually Europe will come out of this and it, whereas we're used to from 1945 until recently it was the United States that was the beacon. But in fact today, GDPR has now been adopted basically word for word by the California State Legislature and you now have more or less the same rights in California as you do as a European uh, uh, in the digital world. So it may, this is a chance for Europe. Whether it picks it up or not is a different question and I don't know. It really, I mean, this is a challenge. But I think it's the big challenge that we face as we go into the future. And one of, the, what I, one of my concerns for the last several years is, does democracy even have a chance in the digital era? Mm -hmm. The digital era, I maintain, began not when we started having computers. Those have been around for 70, 80 years. Not even with the PC, because as late as the late 90s, the most computerized country was the United States, where only 36% of people had computers at home. It began somewhere around 2006 uh, when we got the smartphone. And you can see it now that, I mean, anywhere in the world, and uh, we're talking about going to like, I mean, not just rich Western Europe, but anywhere you can go to the poorest parts of the world and you will see people walking around like this, staring at their screens. Because the smartphone gave them access to the internet. On top of that, I mean, the second component led to the creation of this, of this new world is uh, Facebook, which uh, really experienced its huge leap in use once Zuckerberg decided to put the Facebook platform on the smartphone. Mm -hmm. And now they say they reach three billion people. And if you add to that another 1.3 billion people on WeChat, um, we've got much of the world covered. Um, and that is the world that people live in. And that is what is being manipulated in elections. That is being manipulated uh, with lies and it's been using lies. It's, it's, I mean, we, we were saying before, I mean, three billion people on uh, Facebook, but, two, uh, but one billion of that is not really there. I mean, they're bots, they're not even human. But all of these, all of the, these incredible manipulations that were never possible before our enslavement, or being in thrall at least, of the, uh, of the internet, I mean, this is why, I mean, digitization is great, but I'm not sure about democracy and digitization in the era of, of uh, social media. Mm -hmm. So, Tim, how much does it matter, the digital world? Does it change people um, as citizens, as voters? Um, or do they become essentially just economic units? Well, I, I think, if, if these things that we value, like democracy and law and rights, are going to exist, they have to exist in the technological world that we live in. And that's, that's always been true. The technology is always a challenge. I mean, if you think about the book, which is now, you know, very, at least I assume among, you know, the people here, the book is a very positively evaluated object. Probably people who read books, you think, well, those are liberal individuals who, you know, vote for the right people and are nice to their children and, you know, pet strange dogs on the street. Um, but for 150 years, Europeans killed each other because of books. Uh, a third of the population of this continent was killed largely because of the book. Uh, 150 years of religious war largely due to the printing press. With the internet, I don't think we have 150 years to figure it out, right? I mean, it's roughly 150 years from religious wars to enlightenment. We don't have that 150 years this time around for various reasons. So I, I think of the internet as one more technological challenge, which um, I don't want to say it either dooms democracy or makes democracy easy. I think it's a challenge that we then have to meet. And then the question is, how we how we meet it. I think we only meet it by understanding it for what it is, which is something which does change us. I mean, I would, 
I, there's a there's an even you know there's a more fundamental analysis about 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 social media, which I'm glad I'm glad um, President Ellis brought up. I mean, social media does change the it does change the way that you're human. It rewires your brain. I mean, the the MRA studies on this are pretty frightening if you read them. The thing I said about memory is not a joke. Um, it really disrupts concentration. If you happen to be a university student, you might be interested to know that. If you put your if you put your phone someplace where you can't see it, you'll perform better on tests. And if you leave your phone in your room, you will perform still better on tests because your brain treats your phone as an addendum to itself. And so, if the phone is physically visible, your brain says, "Okay, I'm on holiday," which makes it harder to write those essay questions because your brain is like, "No, this isn't my job. Let that thing over there do it." That thing's got lots of cool things it remembers, right? Because your brain doesn't know that during the exam you're not allowed to look things up on Wikipedia. I'm, I'm not joking. This is these test results are actually. I mean, this this is an empirical. This is an experimental result which has been which has been found repeatedly. But it's. I mean, the, it changes us politically because the way the platform, the way. I mean, let's say with Facebook, well, the way Facebook works is. It, it, ha it, it hacks your brain. The first hack is that it separates you from other human beings, right? This posture, you're separated from human beings. The second hack is that it gives you intermittent reinforcement. So what the behaviorists figured out with rats and pigeons works on us. If you, if I, if you get a bunch of nice things and then one, one not nice thing, a bunch of nice things, then one not nice thing, that keeps your attention. And the reason why attention is important is that the whole thing is about advertising. And then once, and, and the way that, we, and, the, and the bunch of nice things are the things you already believe. That's another brain hack. It's called confirmation bias. And then you're, 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 it's like you're surrounded by a bunch of other people who agree with you on, on Facebook, right? That's another brain hack. It's called, um, it's called social confirmation. Um, and so then you start to think, well, what I think really is right. I mean, a lot of people seem to think this, and I'm hearing it over and over again. And and you're not really in touch with other people so much anymore. And then you start to think, well, people who would disagree with me, I mean, they're not just wrong, but they must have bad motives because how could anyone think these things, which I don't think. And and that is an unintended consequence of the advertise or the surveillance capitalism, which Shoshana Zuboff's book is about. Um, but it is a consequence. It, it polarizes us, and it polarizes. I mean, and we saw this in the Arab Spring. We saw this in Ukraine. Um, we saw this with Black Lives Matter in the United States. We saw this in the genocide of the Rohingya. This is a dynamic which is, seems to be pretty much universally true, and that is. I mean, that, that's a particular thing which is quite hard for democracy because if you if you move back, and this now links back to the earlier conversation about the 20s and 30s, this is what one of the reasons why Carl Schmitt is back in fashion because Carl Schmitt says, Carl Schmitt, the most famous Nazi legal theorist, Carl Schmitt says politics starts from defining the enemy. And that, you know, and that's where a lot of politics now starts. You don't have a you don't say who you are, right? You don't say who the nation is, you don't say what you want to do, you just say that's the enemy, right? And then politics starts from there. I'm afraid that the way the internet is currently set up pushes us in that direction. It doesn't have to, though. There are other things you can do. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm glad I'm in Estonia, there are a lot of them, I wish I'd said this in the beginning, it is really a great pleasure to be here in this anniversary. I've got myself thinking how, you know, if you count the years, we are now at a moment where Estonia has been an independent country longer than it was a Soviet republic, if you count the interwar period plus since 1990, right, which is a nice, I find that a nice thought. Um, so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very glad very glad to be here. I'm very glad that, you know, I'm very glad about this, this, and this all on the same place. And I, you know, it's, I'm not so glad that the German thing is four times as big as the American one, but, but it's, it's, prob it's probably appropriate in the, in the current situation. It represents, I think, the financial support. Well, <laughs> I know. Let me, let me have my joke. Um, <laughs> you're always allowed to have self-deprecating jokes. Um, but, but, um, but, so, but, but the other thing I'm glad about Estonia is that, I mean, Professor Elvis was too modest to mention this, but the, one of the things that Estonia did was it established an identity, right? for citizens on the internet. That is one of the big pieces which is missing. Human beings actually don't exist on the internet as such. You don't have a right to, you don't have a right to 
identify others. You don't have a right to exist as a person. That's a big thing which the, the you know, the, the, the not so smart libertarian intervent, in, inventors of the internet left out. They thought the market would sort it out, which of course, yeah. Didn't happen. So the internet can't, I'm gonna stop this now, but the internet can be made to look differently than it, than it looks right now. Just like the printing press could be made into this thing which creates the peaceful, the peaceful book that we like. So uh, now, as that... Professor Ilves of Stanford University, how do you do that? How do you make the internet a more positive thing for people? Well, I think this is gonna be a huge problem, and I don't know whether it's resolvable, but I think that uh, in the internet digital era, anonymity and democracy are incompatible. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can have both. Uh, that uh, the free reign of saying whatever you want and sort of destroying lives and destroying people as we see happening over and over again yeah. through dox, anonymous doxing, through these attacks we see. I mean, this is ongoing. Um, I mean, if you just read the news in the United States, I mean, every day anyone who says something immediately, it's going to be like, trolls start doing things and we had this case there's a woman uh, the woman who te who uh, raised the issue last year of uh, the then supreme court candidate kavanaugh yes. she said she had to within nine months she had to move four times uh, and she's a middle class professor and she had to hire security mm -hmm. to because they because people wanted to kill her or they were threatening to kill her. Mm -hmm. And then you have this other phenomenon of swatting where you would uh, anonymous people would call the police and say there's this horrible terrorist or something incident going on and this, the special weapons and tactics police, also the SWAT team uh, here in Estonia, I mean, they, they come out with their, you know, with their, all their gear and they burst in and then it turns out that it says nothing, it's not true. And I think all of this is made possible through anonymity, and anonymity is enabled in the era of mass, of, of modern instantaneous communication and specific communication on the internet uh, enables behaviors that never before were possible. And, and what, it, it, what underlies is anonymity. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, everyone's going, oh, you can't get rid of anonymity. That's our right to have, be anonymous. Uh, well, that's why I'm saying it's, this is the, a conflict we will have to resolve in the future if we want to maintain, uh, maintain, maintain democracy. Mm -hmm. And so the digital fingerprint that, for example, journalists use to prove that they're genuine, that they are a journalist, or indeed the Estonian e-identity, which I think is, is for companies, not for individuals. But, I hesitate but, to say that in such a room of experts. It's, it's for uh, commercial um, entities rather than for individuals. The EID is yeah, for individuals. EID. Individual. But, it, but it, it, well, okay, it doesn't, it doesn't grant you certain citizen, it doesn't grant you citizenship rights. It, it grants you a different set of oh, rights. Oh, the e-residency the e broad, it's, it's for people who want to establish a company. Yes, you, it's, it's establish, you, are, you have your identity, but then you can, you have the right. I mean, these are some of the positive things that come out of a digital revolution. You can start thinking differently, and in fact, mm -hmm. it is no longer the monopoly of, I mean, the state, can offer certain rights, not citizenship rights, not mm -hmm. uh, political and social rights, but certainly the right to establish a business you can do as long as you know who's who. Because in the old days, you knew who was who on your territory. But now we know, we can know who you are if you're not on the territory, so why not give you the rights to establish a company made much of by Ukrainians who don't have PayPal or now maybe more and more by Brits who are afraid to be, want to have their co little company in the EU. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I, on this, th this connects to the question of free speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the curious thing about free speech now, I think, is that it's being invoked to protect the cowardly and the non-human. So, I mean, the, the, the example that, that, that Thomas Ilves gave of, of, the, of, of the woman who was brave enough to tell her story about someone who was going to be much more powerful than her, this is repeated over and over and over and over again. I mean, the people who are testifying to the U.S. Congress now um, about our president's latest attempt to get foreigners to help him win an election, um, they are now all, this is all happening to them, right? Um, it, it, even people, I mean, lifelong civil servants with no political profile, this is all happening to them. And who is doing it to them? Cowards, cowards, cowards and machines. Cowards and machines, people who don't reveal their identity and their non-human amplifiers. Whereas the purpose of free speech is to protect, 
I mean, going back to Euripides, the purpose of free speech is to protect truthful, risky speech. It's, to, it's precisely to protect the people who put themselves out there for the service of the greater good. So free speech has been turned around. It's been turned around as a weapon against the people who actually have the courage to tell the truth, which is a sign that something has gone wrong. And I agree that that, that that thing which has gone wrong is one of the things which has gone wrong is, is anonymity. If a person is willing to put her or his name out there and take a risk, that person should not then face the attack of millions of non-humans plus thousands of cowards, thousands of anonymous cowards. So if we define, I think we have to, I mean, one of the things which has to be rehumanized is the notion of free speech. That for there to be free speech, there has to be a free speaker and it has to be clear who that free speaker is. I do not have the right to use my computer savvy and capacity to bring down a million bits of hate on any member of you, right? Which I can technically do, and you could do it to me too. But that's not free speech because it's not me. I'm not taking, the, I'm not taking a risk, and it's not true, right? So this is, uh, free speech is one of the things which I think has to be rehumanized if we're, going to, if we're going to get serious about democracy in the digital age. I think one thing that will also come out of this is you will get the argument immediately about what about in a repressive societies we need to maintain man, man, anonymity. I mean, I have two points. One is that I think in the repressive authoritarian societies that you don't have anonymity either. You may think you do, but they know who you are. But the other point is I think that we will, see that as, as as we progress, in fact, that liberal democracies will be the ones who will get rid of anonymity uh, but will maintain their freedom, uh, and this will actually form kind of a, a union of those societies where you have that, have, you maintain democracy, you maintain it's liberty, but you won't have anonymity. It's also, I mean, it's also self-defense of the democratic society. So in the fall of 2016, which as you, I know it was a long time ago, but like, Bear with me. Um, I'm a historian. I work on ancient periods like 2016. In the fall of 2016, the 20 most read news stories on Facebook um, that were inventions, and I don't mean they were controversial, or f I mean that they were literally fictions, right, that pretended to be news stories, so fake news. Um, those 20 were considerably more widely read than the 20 most popular actual news stories on Facebook. Now, why is this self-defense? It's self-defense because the 20 actual news stories were all attributed to a reporter and, and to a newspaper, and that was true. But the 20 fake ones were, came from Russia and Macedonia, a couple of them came from Macedonia, but the, if, if you had known where they came from, you wouldn't have thought they were news stories, right? At least you would have had a chance to say, okay, am I really going to believe this thing which the Russians are telling me? Um, and so that's, that's what anonymity allows. It allows for this confusion between what is actually, you know, responsible news reporting and what's not responsible news reporting. So I'm just trying to add to the point about democracies. If democracies are going to survive, they're going to have to have some way of distinguishing the flood of nonsense which is meant to destroy them from the honest work of their own reporters. I'd like to introduce one more topic before coming to all of your questions and, and ideas too. Um, and that's the overlap that we evidently see between um, authoritarians or would-be authoritarians, um, those who speak against migrants and migration, and those who deny that climate change is caused by humans. Now, this might seem like a kind of strange coincidence, but you find it over and over again in many different places in the world and also um, in many different kinds of debates. Now, what's going on there? Is this because those who want to deny climate change are essentially funded by the same people who also want to um, uh, prevent migration? Is there some kind of conspiracy there? Um, so that's, that's one question. Is it a worldview that essentially is about protecting particular um, structures of power, essentially, in particular commercial uh, corporate interests as well as, uh, as, well as um, uh, political interests? Um, or is it part of a worldview that it basically says, just don't worry about the future, don't think about the past, just focus on consuming things today? Why is it that there is this coincidence? Well, first of all, I think it's utterly irrational to maintain these two beliefs, at least in here, where you see people, the people who deny climate change also are the ones who are the most anti-immigrant. Now, if, I mean, let's put it this way, if you, 
if you if you allow the cl uh, the climate to change to the point where life becomes in uninhabitable, and you already see this with the desertification of southern Italy, uh, parts of Greece, and uh, in Spain, people are going to move north. <laughs> No, no, you can't have it both ways, right? You don't want to have those people in this country, but you also don't want to do anything about the thing that is going to drive massive migration northward. Uh, so it's already intellectually incompatible, which of course to me is no surprise given the people who are saying these things. They can actually believe two opposing things or contradictory things at the same time. That's, but that's <laughs> so anyway I don't understand that but it is in fact true that there are in, I mean the people who are I mean the, in the United States especially you see sort of climate denialism and anti-immigrant attitudes mm -hmm. and I don't see I mean maybe they just have problems putting yeah. things together yeah I mean I think you, you 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 actually gave all the answers to the question in 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 in, 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 in the question but <laughs> one of them I mean so first of all let me let me just repeat the point that it's there is something there's something sinister about this because the the very people who are trying to tell you that politics are, is all about refugees are the people who are manufacturing the refugees and when I say manufacturing I'm using the present tense this is not some kind of future catastrophe where one day there will be lots of climate refugees from northern Africa and the Middle East and Europe these people are already climate refugees. The Arab Spring happened because of droughts, which caused China to buy up food supplies, which led to food shortages in Egypt, which led to protests. Now, people in Egypt had other reasons to protest, but without climate, no, probably no Arab Spring. Syria, there used to be this thing called the Fertile Crescent, um, which no longer exists, thanks to climate change, which led to lots of internal migration to big cities, which was one of the factors behind the political unrest which led to the civil war in Syria. Not the only one. America invading Iraq and driving a couple of Iraqis into Syria, a couple million Iraqis into Syria also didn't help. But one of the conditions in both of these things was climate change. In America, we do have a crisis at the southern border. It's a humanitarian crisis largely caused by climate change. When Mexico City falls into the earth, which it eventually will if climate change continues, we're going to have more Mexican migrants. So I'm, this is the present tense. This is happening now. Now the story that like it's us and them and they're Muslims and we're not and they're brown and we're not and so on, that is a way of distracting you from the thing that you could actually do to stop this, or we, I should say, could do to stop this, which is to halt and reverse climate change, and it's, which is technically possible. I mean, that's the sad thing about, about all this. We, we, don't, we couldn't just halt it. We could actually reverse it if we got our acts together. I realize, I mean, in my American accent, as we pull out of Paris, you know, this is a ridiculous thing to say. But we could do it. It's not harder than the moonshot, and the moonshot was 50 years ago. We could do it. And if we don't do it, it's largely because we let ourselves get drawn into this silly us and them migrant kind of politics. Um, which, which, which makes us not see the problem. But I think there's something sinister about it. I mean, I think the, the people who are bringing you migrant politics are also bringing you migrants. And that seems like, to me, that looks a bit like a strategy. Um, that in you know the next 50 years could either be a 50 years where we solve the climate problem, or it could be a 50 years where some migrants actually do start coming to Estonia, <laughs> right? Um, because climate, you know, because climate change actually reaches that point where even Estonia is 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 touched. So I think there's something. I think I think this actually. I don't think it. Is, I mean, I think some people are you know so dumb so as not to see it. But I think there are other people who do see it, and I think it only takes a few of them. Which brings me to the question of funding. I mean, the the hydrocarbon oligarchs. You know, Mr. Putin is number one hydrocarbon oligarch. They fund climate denial. The the Koch brothers. Okay, there's only one of them now. Mr. Koch in the U.S. funds climate change denial because he's a hydrocarbon oligarch. That is not. That's like. You know, it's too bad there are no Marxists anymore because, like, that's Marxism 101. You know, what's like, what is the billionaire's interest? Hmm, his interest is to destroy the world, so he acts consistent with that interest, right? Um, unfortunately, that strain of Marxism is no longer here to remind us what you know what billionaires might actually do if they have lots of power. But it's actually in that case not that complicated. If you're Mr. Putin and you and your whole regime and your personal wealth depends upon natural gas, or if you're Mr. Koch. And your whole your power in the U.S. and your wealth depends on natural gas and oil. Naturally, you're going to say there's no climate change. It's not complicated, but it's not just that you say it. It's that you fund people. In, in and so there is actually, there is a funding network which is only partially understood, but it does it overlaps, although not perfectly. It overlaps with people who fund the far right. So that's part of the answer. 
And climate change, real climate action to prevent catastrophic, um, making the, the earth um, uninhabitable, will require exactly the kinds of things we've been talking about this conversation as being an increasingly short supply. So good governance, uh, intelligent citizens who have a sense of um, the, the interests of the common interests that they have with other humans, uh, not only in their own society, but also around the world. Uh, it'll also require technological solutions, but ones which aren't driven just by the attention economy Economy, but uh, driven by the public interest, i.e. not only by uh, the profit um, incentive of the market, but also by the fact that, that humans need these things. So what's, how, if, if yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, as, as, <laughs> as we were given as the, the main title for this session, um, what is the mystery in climate change that can really be where we, we can see what the clues are now, we can see what the answers are now? How do you uh, get a sense of common destiny across nations that have been driven apart um, by really toxic politics in increasingly atomized societies in which people are glued to their phones? And when it's harder and harder in the 21st century to get the kind of governance that leads to major infrastructure projects of the kind that will be needed to decarbonize the economy, to create um, you know, everything from um, carbon-free uh, transport through to much more energy-efficient housing and, and public buildings. Have we arrived at the climate challenge at exactly the wrong moment in history? <laughs> Sorry to end, end on very pessimistic. Yeah, you're, you're, no, give me some optimism. Yeah, you're giving, us a, you're giving us a hard assignment. You want to go first or do you want me to... Buy you some time. Uh, you can buy some time. Uh, <laughs> I actually, Where are the beacons I, of hope? I, I actually, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, it won't be enough, but I actually do have faith in Europe doing this because it is mm -hmm. really the only place where uh, you can have sort of a larger unit, a larger entity can do it. Uh, you have a collective action right. platform in Europe. Of course, I mean, I actually think maybe China can also do it because mm -hmm. basically, I mean, they can mobilize uh, people and do a policy, whether they do or not, but I mean, they, it is possible. Russia, I mean, Russia has kind of been bizarre on this because, um, I mean, they, they fund climate denialism. On the other hand, the, in, uh, all of their infrastructure and on this built on the permafrost the sinking is going to destroy their own carbon economy mm -hmm. it's kind of strange but it's basically you're not going to be able to pump oil out of uh, hunty mansisk for long if uh, if the ground starts melting uh, but in the united states uh, i don't i mean which is one of the biggest sort of producer of hydrocarbons I don't see it happening uh, with this administration, at least, uh, so actively working against it and working against all kinds of, eco of ecological safeguards that have been built over. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's bizarre that uh, that the uh, basically the Environmental Protection Act of 1972 or whatever year it was. I mean, that was something that was pushed through by Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Richard Nixon was a great ecologist, and, <laughs> and it's being it's been, been dismantled by another Republican president. Mm -hmm. Well, which Richard Nixon also thought that, that everyone should have a basic income. <laughs> it's an interesting that was, sort of basic thing. income was almost passed into U.S. law, uh -huh. failed by a few votes, and Richard Nixon was in favor of it. So consider consider that, right? Um, in the early, late 60s and early 70s, there was a, pretty much a political consensus that Americans should have a basic income. So there are which, ideas which, which we could have afforded then and we could have afforded now. I have, I have, right? yeah, I, well, I'm just, just like, I'm just trying, one of the things which is wrong with the conversation is that we think lots of things aren't possible, which mm -hmm. actually not only are possible, but are pretty easy. Mm -hmm. So like minim, minimum income in the U.S. would be easy. That's easy. We could do that. Um, stopping climate change. The only problems are political. I mean, there are technical problems, but I believe those technical problems would be very quickly overcome if we could get the politics right. I mean, it would be really, like, let's imagine we're the only intelligent species in the universe 
wouldn't this be a sad way to go down, right? That we can't even have an intelligent conversation about the thing which is obviously leading to our extinction. Wouldn't we prefer to go down against some bigger threat than that? I mean, don't we at least want to survive this so that like some real Hollywood type threat can take us down? <laughs> because frankly, people, this is kind of pathetic as a way to go down. The slow boiling like yeah, a Yeah, yeah. It like is a movie. It's unfortunately like not even a great B, but a great C movie, but and which you could you before you were able to download it for free, but then came the Trump administration and it became so precise. It's called Idiocracy, and it really is a very bad movie. But it is, uh, but it is about what happens after 500 years of dumbing down, uh, and it is sort of the Trump or sort of America, current America on steroids. Uh, and so I, I would encourage you to watch it. And I have to warn you, it is a bad movie. It's just badly yeah. done. But, uh, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it is like what will happen if we don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, we've been dumb before. I just want us to be dumb again. You know, I want us to have a future in which we be dumb again. So I'm going to try with, the, I mean, I do have some, I, not op, I'm, I'm not optimistic exactly, but I do have a couple of hopeful notes I'd like to strike. The first is that, it is possible, I think, with hard, with, 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 with hard focused work to bring the concept of the future back into politics. I think that's something that rhetorically um, we have to do, and especially young people have to do. Because the, the way that, this, the, way that the, the Stalins and the Hitlers won was that they had a different future. I mean, a dark future, but an energizing future. The way that the authoritarians now work is that they take the future off the table as a subject of politics, right? I mean, I, mean, I, I was giving a lecture at, in, in university in Bratislava, and a very smart young man asked me afterwards, you know, professor, no, during the thing, what was it like, Professor Snyder, when there was a future? And I realized, like, yeah, you know, if you're 20 years old, you've been living in this no history, no future politics your, your whole life. But for 250 years in the West, we were specialists at coming up with futures. That's what we did. That's what democracy was about. It was coming up with competitive, alternative futures. And a lot of that work can be done intellectually. Like that's, I think, a first push that can, that can be done to, re, to claim that the future matters again and to start filling up the future with things that are good, um, which is the other thing I want to say. A lot of that you ask, you know, there's a relationship between climate change and, and democracy. There's a relationship between climate, between digital stuff and democracy, and it's negative. But these things can be turned around, right? I mean, hydrocarbon politics centralizes wealth and power. But if you start moving away from hydrocarbon politics, you get a decentralization. In other words, you get a positive feedback loop, right? So if you can make a start on some of these things, then the struggle becomes easier rather than harder. The hardest, I think the hardest moment, I mean, the hardest moment is right now when, um, you know, when, when these lobbies, political and economic, have the hold that they have. But if you can, if, once you make a start, I think actually things start to get easier. And, you know, and by the way, like, everybody forgets about technology because we've decided that technology are the cheap brain hacks which keep us focused on the screen. That's not technology, you know? That's just not technology. Like anything that a 19-year-old can plagiarize from another 19-year-old is not technology. You know, most of the stuff that comes out of Silicon Valley is like as complicated as a slingshot. You're less so. It's not technology. That's not technology. Technology is stuff in the three-dimensional world, which makes things hopefully better, right? It's not the two-dimensional world which makes you fat until you die. It's the three-dimensional world which changes things right, um, which changes things. And that kind of technology can exist. So, I mean, what China might solve that we don't solve would be fusion. I think it would be bad if China solved we it, but there is, one tech, there is one technological silver bullet to, to all this, and that's fusion. You know, note the Europeans, right, I mean, this kind of went under the radar, but despite Brexit, the European Union is still funding its fusion research, which is in England, for the very good reason that fusion research might actually save the species. Um, that was, that's not going to be disrupted by Brexit. That treaty has already been signed because even the stupidest politicians in the world or in Britain, which comes to the same thing at the moment, um, <laughs> realize that that is something that you don't cut loose, 
right? Um, so there are tech, there are actually technological solutions. Um, we just if we can keep our eye on those and not on the tech which which brings. So that's another example of a positive feedback loop. Like when, if wind and solar were subsidized the way that hydrocarbons are subsidized, mm -hmm. we would start to see positive feedback loops there. If some, if if China, the U.S. or Europe, hopefully Europe or the U.S. breaks through on fusion, we'll start to see positive feedback loops there. So I, I don't think it's all I don't think it's all dark. That's great, and perhaps also the fact that um, those who are about to gain the right to vote are the ones who are out on the street. Um, that and the, the, the pressure um, of, of the urgency of climate change will only get greater as they progress through their lives. Um, but the question, the problem is, will those who are to come after them, can they gain rights in our societies fast enough to essentially protect the future? Can we future-proof for the future humans who don't have a vote yet? I think this could be a, a very, I won't ask you to, to, to answer that because we, we also need to, to start to take some questions. But I think it's an interesting question of, of we've never had to do that before. We've often allowed um, the ghosts of history and, and those who came before us to have a big influence on our societies. Now we need to allow those who are going to come after us to have a much bigger impact on our, in our societies and our politics. So who would like to ask a question? And I just, I must emphasize these should be questions, not statements, not lectures, not stories, but questions. Thank you. My name is Lisa Past, and I work for the Estonian government office, despite of which I'm actually a human rights activist. And for me, what you've been talking about so much goes back to fundamentally the decline of the quality of public discourse, the conspiracy theories, the decline, all of that. So my question is, are we in terms of quality of public debate? and the space for public debate at the point where we're to abandon all hope, or is there hope and where exactly is it? Okay, I'm gonna take three questions because there are lots of hands. Go ahead, and then you can, you can pick which one you like the best. My name is Aku Sorain, and I'm attorney here. And you mentioned uh, Professor Snyder in the beginning that this, uh, the, the politics and the shift of the public opinion, what we see today, is not really nationalism. But, um, but most likely it's the populism, what, what we see today. And I would like to ask from you that, what is the reason for the rise and success of the populism simultaneously in so many places? Mm -hmm. Okay, and one more for this round. There was, there was one here. Okay, maybe it's gone shy. Okay, so go ahead and take those two. Well, to answer your question, I think really has to do with the technology because in fact, the spread of bad ideas, the creation of bubbles, the, uh, the, the, the closed communities of people sort of feeding each other's conspiracy theories uh, is clearly something that, uh, I mean, as long as, as long as you had uh, sort of newspapers as the primary source of information that were, I mean, that were kind of regulating themselves in terms of truth as opposed to just having massive conspiracy theories. Um, I mean, that, that's what enables, as I, to my belief, has enabled populism across the democratic world. Yeah, I'm gonna go in reverse order. The two questions are, are related. So I'm, I, I hesitate with populism too, because for two reasons. The first is that Populism has the word people in it, and I am not sure that much of what we're seeing really is about people. The point that I'm making about the, 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 digital, the, the digital population, I mean it very seriously, that most of the voices that one is encountering, even the human voices, are brought to you by entities that are not human. And you know what the people we call populists know how to say is brought to them by private companies or their own consultants who are trying to game the algorithms of what we want to hear. I'm not sure that's populism because I think populism requires even a demagogue to directly listen to the people <laughs> as opposed to go, go by way of these intermediates that are not actually human. And that goes to the question, I mean, I'm just amplifying the point, that goes to the question of why it's the same everywhere or why it's similar everywhere. Because it, the, the, what people fear is the, you know, what, what we fear is the surprise. We fear, we fear the other, we fear, we fear change. And that's, that's universal. And that's why enlightening people is always work. Um, and de-enlighten them is always, is always, you know, relatively, relatively easy. 
Um, on, but, but you know, on on the question of, of where it's all coming from and why it's why it's so some again, I don't I don't like populism. I think of it as not even populism because it like another reason is that populism historically involved you criticizing the elite but then actually doing something. Whereas in my country, at least, um, the populist, if you want to call it populism, I mean, what Mr. Trump does is he criticizes the elite and then gives the elite a huge tax break. That's not populism for me. I mean, I, in my book, I call that sado populism, um, where you know you're, you, you you tell people that the elite is bad and then you hurt the people who you just told this to. But it's it's not populism in the traditional 19th century sense, which is you, you, in America at least you criticize Wall Street or the gold standard or whatever it is. But then you may actually implement some policies which distribute wealth, um, probably not towards everybody, probably towards white people mainly. But at least you then have some policy action which is redistributive. Much of these people were calling, many of these people are calling populists don't do that. In Poland they do, but in a lot of places they don't. This is another reason I hesitate. I think of them, I think of them as not even populists, the same way as I think of a lot of our nationalists as not even nationalists and our fascists as not even fascists. Like they bring some of the fascist histor history with them, but they don't actually have the follow through. You know, so they're bad, but they're not they're not bad in in the same way. But I think you know part of the reason why this connects the two questions. I mean, part of the reason why it's all the same is the decline of um, the decline of local news, um, and you can kind of measure this. Like the places where local news goes disappears first, like the Russian Federation, are the places that are ahead of the curve, and then America and Britain come next. And I think that's for a reason. America is losing its is losing its local news, and that has the terrible consequence that we all become predictable. Because if we don't, to, to the one thing, the, the only thing which is unpredictable in the world is what's true. The false is predictable, right? Like I can predict what people are afraid of. I can predict like how Mr. Trump's going to lie. That's predictable. The only thing which is unpredictable in the world is what's true. <laughs> but when we have fewer reporters reporting and fewer people reading history and scientists taken less seriously, then there's less unpredictable stuff in the world, and then we all become more predictable. And the predictability. Um, is goes to the public discourse, right? It's not just that like everyone's behaving badly, which of course they are, we are. It's that there are structural reasons, right? And the predictability is a big part of it. Public discourse becomes polarized and simplified when there isn't enough unpredictability, when there isn't enough factual material that politicians and others have to deal with. If I can clear out all the factual material and just work with people's fears, that's a much simpler and more awful, as you say, public discourse. So I think, I think those things are, are, are organically connected. Great. Yes, go over here. So my name is Eid Bergman. I'm an attorney. And I put together bits of your conversation about democracy. So I hear that uh, um, uh, politics is the biggest hinder to uh, uh, solve the climate crisis and decrease of IQ and the uh, use of fears of people. And my question would be, is democracy still the best concept? Or if it's not, would you have another one? Great question. I love, I love democracy. So if you're asking me personally, I love democracy. And not just because, I mean, Churchill said it's better than all the alternatives, and I would stick with that. And by the way, that's, I think that's one of the few things that a famous person is supposed to have said that he actually, actually. did say. <laughs> Most of the time, I mean, most of the time, if a famous person has a famous quote and it's in the front of a book, it, they never actually said it. So like when you read a history book, the sentence you should discard is the one that's at the beginning where they quote a famous person, because usually they're so famous nobody ever checks and no, they didn't actually say that. Especially if they're dead. Yeah, but I think Churchill actually did say that democracy is the worst system except for all the others. I think that's true. I think it's very hard to come up with an alternative that wouldn't have all the problems but worse. But I also think democracy is just a good thing. I mean, I think that people ruling is a good thing. And, I, and the other implicit premise that you have to become a people in order to rule, right? I mean, one way to think about this digitalization problem is that it stops us from becoming a people because it divides us along the things that we're afraid of to the point where then I start to think my greatest enemy is inside the country as opposed to you know, a real future threat or a real foreign country. So, I mean, one of the challenges of democracy is that there has to be a demos and that's, and that's work. But I believe that that's work worth carrying out. So no, I, I, don't, I wouldn't replace democracy with anything else. I mean, I think the very way that democracy is being threatened shows us that extinction will come faster with digital oligarchy 
then it's going to come with democracy. I'm not saying democracy is going to save us, but I would say democracy is our, would be our only chance because the people who, the, the, the people who think, and this goes back to your question about, you know, the authoritarians and climate denial, the people who have $20 billion believe they can escape. They're wrong, right? Because angry mobs are going to shoot them and their families. But at, you know, at a certain point, like this whole escape to New Zealand thing is just so silly. You know, what do you think is really going to happen to you when you get to New Zealand? You know, are you going to really be met by butlers with white gloves or are you going to be met by angry people who steal your plane? Um, I think that's an easy one, but, but, but the, the thing is because of the huge inequality, um, in different, you know, the people who have the big money are thinking in terms of escape as opposed to preservation. The only way you're going to get the idea of preservation is through democracy. If we allow the continuing, the alternatives to democracy are, hey, let's let everybody who has lots of money continue to have lots of money and escape his fantasies. Um, that's the real alternative. I think that alternative is going to lead to extinction. So, no, I think democracy, I mean, I sincerely think, I like democracy, but I also sincerely think it's the best chance to survive. I think one of the greatest victims of misunderstanding in the past 30 years, precisely 30 years, is Francis Fukuyama. Because when he said, when he, his title was The End of History, it was not like it stops, rather it is the meaning of end, that is, that is the goal. The goal, the where we, I mean, it's a very Hegelian or neo-Hegelian view, but that there is a purpose to all this and that the end, that the best thing that we have and where we're moving toward, the end station is liberal democracy. But unfortunately, I think it's just a bad choice of words or, or his editor said, you know, don't say end station, so just put like end. And so everyone says, I mean, in Estonian, it's translated as I lup, means like finished, whereas his thing is where history is going is that all these other things, you know, we had, you know, we had, we had all of these bad things in the past, you know, sort of, you know, Egypt and Rome and all this stuff that wasn't really good. And we've kindly gotten to a, a point where like, yeah, this kind of works and this brings the greatest happiness to the greatest number. And that is liberal democracy, respect for human rights and free and fair elections and rule of law. And this is what it is. And this is where that is our goal. Uh, but anyway, because you used the word end, it was taken as, you know, finito, over. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it also, the fact that that was taken up, though, it was interpreted in that way because people had a view that somehow democratization was a linear process. It was a one-way street. You start on the road to democracy and you never turn back. You never go back to authoritarianism because once you've breathed the sweet air of freedom, you'll never want to return. And what we're seeing now is actually there are lots of temptations that would make you yeah, return, okay. turn the, the, against the, uh, it. The Freedom House ratings, yeah. I mean, it's like fewer and fewer. I mean, every year there's one or two fewer countries that is a democracy. And but, some but, of them are in the European but, Union. But one of the reasons why this question is so important is this notion of end, because it's important to ask whether we want democracy, because if we don't want it, we're not going to have it. It's not handed to us by anything. It's not the natural state of affairs. So mm -hmm. I think of no democracy as you know, as a, as a verb, I mean, it's democracy is a way of trying to be in the world. You have to, you have to want it or, or, or you're not, or you're not going to get it. Um, on the Fukuyama thing, the, the, the thing that strikes me about like, not the Fukuyama essay itself, but the general mood of the early nineties was that everybody said, well, if you're a realist, you understand that there's no alternative. Like this is the way it has to be. There are no alternatives. And like, this is the real world. This is the way it really is. But in that real world, we forgot about the world. I mean, in the late 80s, we already knew there was climate change. Yeah. And the notion that you can't, that like capitalism will not deliver, capitalism will only deliver political solutions and no political problems is an odd one when you already know that there's climate change, mm -hmm. right? Most of the carbon that's in the air has been put there since the revolutions of 1989. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'm not here to celebrate that, right? 30th anniversary of more carbon since the entire previous history of the world, but it is true that we put more carbon in the air since we've known about climate change since before. And so like, I mean, one of the things we need is more realism, like an actual tough realism, which says our politics take place in a world of fusion and photosynthesis, and we have to deal with that. I should also in 1989 had one more thing, which may be very significant, okay. which is Tim Berners-Lee invented the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, mm -hmm. uh, and that's 
that's where the internet started. So, you know, maybe uh, we should think about those two together when we say yeah. 1989. And maybe think about what, right. as of now, 2019, are the HTTP and the climate change of today, the things that we already know about, but which we're not understanding the significance of. So, final question here at the back. Hello. Good evening. My name is Hans Luik. I'm a publisher. And uh, this is a question about the, uh, both of the gentlemen with, uh, could have different perspectives. Uh, taking that uh, Professor Snyder has in, in, uh, in, in no, in, in, in no uh, uh, small words described the role of, of Russian mediation in the uh, presidential elections of the United States in much more dis distinct wording than, uh, than ever uh, and any Mueller investigation has established it. Uh, what's your pick um, uh, of the situation where in relatively small East European countries there's a tendency that the, the forces who are very clearly anti-EU, although those, although those small countries will stand no chance and this is the difference from Britain if they start trade negotiations with big countries and big economies. There's a tendency that those forces get elected to the parliaments, both in Estonia and in Hungary, for instance. Uh, what is the, where, where does it come from? Or as the Russians ask, where do the legs grow, grow from? Is it rather Russian mediation and influence and Russian memes, or is it uh, more the local population who feels disenfranchised, disenfranchised. thank you. Okay, it's a good one to end on. Uh, yes or no question, I think that was, Thomas. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think it's a complex system because it's, it, there has to be some kind of fertile ground there for it to work. On the other hand, it is being pushed. And I mean, you take any question that's, uh, where you have external manipulation, you've got to have something there. Uh, you know, anti-Muslim rhetoric is not going to work if you don't really care, but if you already have this, like, all oh, those ragheads, then, then if you're going to get, start getting anti-Muslim uh, uh, material, you'll use it. Certainly we see that uh, a related question is that it is quite clear that this homophobia that we see being propagated by a party in this country is, I mean, if you actually compare it, if it is like one-to-one -one what's coming out of, uh, from Russia. I mean, it's, I have no doubt that there is, that, that narrative is being pushed. On the EU thing, you know, the only thing that gives me hope is that actually the support for the European, or the, that the Estonian people at least, I can't talk about Hungary, Hungary but the Estonian people uh, are smart enough to realize that being outside of the European Union is the death of the country. That is basically, despite the votes that we had in the election, still 80% of the population really wants to be in the European Union. I think, and the UK is showing what happens. It's, I think it's interesting actually, after the, the last three years, as a result of Brexit, you have seen across the European Union a rise in support for the European Union because for the first time people start saying, well, what would, mean, what would it mean if we were out? And you start thinking about all the things that would happen, beginning just already with the end of the Schengen. So you, can't, you have to show your passport at the Latvian border, um, which God forbid we would never do. Uh, and moving on to you know, agricultural policy and then and then, of course, everything else that has to do with our currency and so forth, we do not want to go back there. But it is certainly being fed from the East. So, so perhaps Britain's greatest contribution so far in the 21st century has been the example effect of what not to do. Yeah, since it's going to keep coming. So on the, the, on the fertile ground question, it's not just that, you know, the, the thing about digitalization, which I'm sure all of you understand, uh, is that it reveals already whether you don't like Muslims or not. So, you know, what the, what, what the Russians did when they invaded Ukraine was that they knew which American leftists were, were, would be vulnerable to hearing that Ukraine was fascist. And so they told them that Ukraine was fascist. They also knew um, which American anti-Semites would be vulnerable to the idea that Ukraine was a Jewish conspiracy. 
And so they sent out both of those messages simultaneously, and they both had an effect. And it doesn't matter whether they contradict, because as we know, these people aren't talking to these people anyway. In our 2016 elections, the Russians knew roughly who was, who was, a, who was African American, and they told the African Americans that Hillary Clinton was racist. They knew who, who was racist, and they told the racists that Hillary Clinton loved black people. It doesn't matter that those things contradict, it just matters that you know, that you know. And so there, there has to be fertile ground, but like the ground is just much more visible than it used to be. It's tended in a different way. And you know, this is, I mean, the, this is the basic 21st century posture of which Russia is just an extreme example. We're just irresponsible. We're, we don't have a goal for America. We just, we're, we just want to destroy it. But you know, if we destroy it, that's your fault because you're the ones who are racists and, you know, and so on, right? So we're just helping you like, on your way down to general human destruction, which is the 21st century irresponsible authoritarian posture. And you know, it, got, it got us to Trump. And the thing that, like, the thing that strikes me about politicians in small countries who imitate Trump, I mean, we might get over this because we're America, right? Um, not because we're smarter or greater, but because we have a huge internal market and we're a big country, okay? But if you're a really small country and you happen to be on the Russian border, doing a Trump imitation may not be the wisest course of action, and especially on the EU question, because I mean, I'm gonna try to link this back to the very beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. The EU is the answer to the question of what you do after empire. And, it's a, it, and those are the alternatives, EU and empire. Free nation state, it's a joke. That ain't gonna happen, not for the British. It's not gonna happen even for the British. You're gonna have an England which is gonna be a Chinese, American, Russian playground. That's not the, 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 this dream that you can escape to freedom by going back to some kind of imagined pure whatever. It's a dream which turns into a nightmare, right? Bre I mean, the, if Brexit actually happens, which I still don't believe it will, but if it actually happens, that will be a nightmare for the English, which will have a hundred more years of teaching you how bad of an idea it was. And hopefully in those hundred years, you will remember that the EU is what you do after empire and that those are the choices, but that the EU can be a good choice, right? That the EU isn't just a way to stave off bad things. As President Elvis was saying, the EU can also be an alternative which helps you deal with digitalization or climate change or the real issues of politics in a, in a positive way. I would say answer, I mean, the, what happened in 2016 and what happens in a number of countries, uh, I mean, it gives genuine meaning to otherwise it's vague terms, surveillance capitalism, but how did they know to target the black people on Facebook with one message and how did they know how to target the anti-Semites Semites or the leftists? It is Cambridge Analytica data on all of the preferences of the people using Facebook and there you had it. I mean, this is, they, I mean, Facebook has those data and it was used by Cambridge Analytica to target different people. So I think this is, I mean, we have to understand that surveillance capitalism is not just like this cute term and it's not just simply anti big company, it is that what you, who you are on your digital, uh, I mean in the digital space is known and is sold and is used. Yeah, but I mean 2016, bad as it is, I mean, I don't know, there's probably some of my, like, are there any Americans out here who think it's great? Because I know you're out there. Um, 2016, as bad as it is, it's just a taste. It's a taste of what happens when hydrocarbon oligarchy, oligarchy that is Mr. Putin, the Russian Federation, and digital oligarchy, that is Cambridge Analytica, Facebook. This is what happens when they get together. And this is why they have to be made less powerful than they are and they have to be kept apart if we wanna have this nice little thing called democracy. Because I think that's what the, the alternative that we have is a lot is those two kinds of oligarchy coming together and crowding everything else out. So we were asked to discuss how um, that yesterday is history and tomorrow is a mystery. Um, not everything that we've talked about suggests that tomorrow is going to be bright. There are plenty of dark spots and plenty of challenges ahead. What I think has been really valuable in this conversation is how much all of these things are interlinked. 
the, everything we've discussed from the starting with uh, nationalism and its threat to democracy through to the digital questions, through to climate, through to the question of, of how power is exercised in the 21st century, which, which you finished with, uh, Tim, that, that um, we've got to see those connections because otherwise we lose the power to understand the world around us. Um, and as both of you have discussed earlier, that's when we're really in trouble, when we stopped understanding the world around us. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us for making tomorrow a little bit less of a mystery in that sense at least. Thank you.